So what I'll, I'll be discussing today is, is some result that, that, uh, that have emerged in recent years about the trainability and the accuracy of artificial neural network. And uh, this talk in particular will be based on a joint work with uh, Grant Krotzkoff, uh, who was my postdoc at, um, at the current institute these last uh, two years and has now moved as a faculty position in Stanford. John Brunner, who is my colleague at the, the Korean Institute, and Sang Dao Chen and Samuel Elassi, who are both students at the, the Korean Institute. So to begin, uh, I would like to show you or discuss, you know, uh, so I'd like to put what I'm going to discuss in, in the context of the enormous success that uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, have obtained in recent years. And on, on this slide, I'm, I'm just mentioning two that I think epitomize this success uh, very well. One, and they're both from DeepMind actually. One is, uh, you know, the system called AlphaGo, or Go Zero, that uh, managed to teach itself to play Go and to become, you know, the best player in the world by great margin. And then, you know, that, that's a few years old already, but there is, uh, you know, announced yesterday or the day before yesterday, there is another, you know, fantastic achievement by this group, which is AlphaFold, where they, they've shown that, uh, you know, neural network and deep learning is in fact capable of predicting uh, folded structure of protein in ways that is much better than other bioinformatic methods that were there. Okay, so the, the reason why, you know, I, I, I would like to put this achievement in the context of, of something that uh, people interested in scientific computing and applied mathematics like myself have had to deal with, you know, for many years, and that's called the curses or the curse of dimensionality. And, and uh, this curse of dimensionality uh, essentially says, it's a term that was called by Bellman in 61. And, and uh, what, what this curse says is essentially that, well, the cost of doing calculation uh, with function that are Lipschitz increases dramatically, exponentially with dimensionality. And, and this essentially says that we thought that uh, computation in high dimension would be impossible. And, and the reason is that if you try to grid space, well, with a certain linear dimension, you need a grid that has become increasingly complicated as the dimensionality of the ambient space uh, increases. Now, this is a fact of life and that's been well documented, but the result of machine learning and in particular, the one that I quoted on, on, on these slides are intriguing in that aspect because I can think about you know a system a, a game like go as an input output I, you know you need you have you're given the state of the game and you need to say where, where you're going to put the next stone on, on 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 the board and and clearly viewed in this way what you know the machine is supposed to learn is a very complicated function in high dimension which is given the board where do, what do i do the same thing is true for protein folding, namely that you're given, uh, you know, a, a sequence of amino acid and you need to find what is the folded state. This is again a very complicated output, uh, you know, in, uh, input output type of uh, problem. And so, you know, this is why I, I call the, 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 the slides the unreasonable effectiveness of machine learning by paraphrasing uh, the title of a famous paper by Eugen Wigner that's shown on, on, on the uh, upper right corner, which is that this begs the question, you know, why, how, and, and, and when can neural network approximate i-dimensional functions and in fact beat or at least alleviate the curse of dimensionality that, uh, you know, that, that I'm discussing here. Okay, so in order to put also this problem into context, I think it is worth mentioning that they, we know, and this will be an important part of the story I'm going to tell you, that there are cases in which we can indeed beat the curse of dimensionality, and, and that is specifically when you want to do integration. So if I want to integrate a function in high dimension, right, so you know, the integral of f on i dimension over a domain, 
Well, it is very well known that that's a classical case of a problem that is cursed by the curse of dimensionality. Namely, that if you use any quadrature rule that is, uh, you know, based the trapezoidal rule, etc., any grid-based quadrature rule, you cannot apply them in high dimension. But there is also a known way to get around that, and that's using Monte Carlo method. In particular, in in the instance that you know of this integral, what you could do is instead of placing a grid, you could simply draw a random sample of points uniformly in the domain omega and simply uh, replace the integral by an empirical average over these points. And if you do that, well, standard result from probability theory tells you, in particular, the, the law of large number tells you that this is a consistent estimator of the, the integral, meaning if you let n go to infinity, the number of samples go to infinity, this empirical average will converge towards the integral that you are looking for. And it also gives you an error estimate. In particular, it tells you that if you compute the expectation between uh, the estimator and the actual value of the integral, the square of that, it scales like one over n times the variance of the function, which is written on the slide. And so what is remarkable here is that you see that Monte Carlo can indeed beat the curse of dimensionality because the factor that you have here, the error, is proportional to 1 over n and not 1 over n to the 1 over d, which is what you, know, the, you would obtain if you were to use grid method. Uh, of course, the reason behind this success is that this is a probabilistic estimate, so that in some sense you can avoid the worst case scenario by uh, using high probability bound that tells you that you know, with high confidence, with high probability, with high likelihood, your, uh, your um, Monte Carlo estimator will give you the right answer, okay? And so the story today will be essentially to show that uh, part of the success of um, machine learning is in fact that one can, they, they have in a way provide a tool that allows us to transfer ideas from Monte Carlo that were really restricted or to problem of integration into the context of function regression. And I will really focus on this today, which is really, I will think about a neural network as a way to construct or to approximate a function in high dimension and see in which uh, context or in, 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 in when can this uh, problem be done efficiently. Okay, in order to fix ideas, and this is mostly to fix notation and to make sure that everybody's on board, let me ve very briefly summarize this. What are the steps that are involved if you try to approximate a function by a neural network? So in this problem of, uh, uh, you know, a function regression. So the problem that, we have, that we're going to be considering here is that we imagine that we have a target function. It can be a very complicated function, but it's a function that takes, uh, you know, so it's defined on the domain omega, which is a subset of uh, Rd, where D is potentially large, and it's a scalar evaluated function. And what we say we want to approximate by neural network, what that means is essentially we try to build an, a neural network approximation function, which is essentially a linear superpos a weighted linear superposition of units, okay? Where the units depend on the parameters, they will be denoted by the z's, the units is the phi, and then there's, you know, weights, uh, an external set of weights, which are the c's, Sometimes I'm going to use a compact notation where I lump the z's and the c's into one single theta because it's easier. But this is the basic representation that you have for a neural network. And you should think about this here as phi is the activation function. So, for example, you should think about the rectified linear unit, which is written there. And this depends on a certain number of parameters. And you want to adjust these parameters in such a way that fm approximate the best one can, the target function f. How can we do that? Well, this is done by introducing a, a measure of this discrepancy between the two functions, which in the context of machine learning is called the empirical, the loss function, the risk, not the population risk, actually. And what is it? It's, it is simply, uh, well, you can define by a different way, but in, in this specific talk, I will focus on one, which is essentially the, the weighted L2 norm of the discrepancy between F and Fm. So you can think about that if you know there's a measure here that's appear, which is the, the measure of the data, new, 
And you can think about taking the expectation over this data of the discrepancy square between F and F, right? Of course, in practice, you cannot evaluate this integral uh, explicitly because it's the same quadrature problem that we had before. So for this problem, we're going to rely essentially on Monte Carlo. And so what you do is that instead of uh, using the population loss, one use the empirical loss or risk, where what is done is that simply the, 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 the expectation of a new is replaced by an empirical uh, average, meaning you draw a data set of x's, xk, from the data distribution, and you replace the expectation over new by the empirical average as written here. And potentially you could add a, an additional term, which is a regularization term that we'll play a role later. And then, no, so now you have a measure of the discrepancy between the two functions. What do you do to optimize the parameters? Well, you just minimize the risk of the parameters, the empirical risk of the parameters. And this is typically done in machine learning by using gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent if you use mini batch. So what does that mean? You compute the, the, the gradient of the risk with respect to the parameters and you take steps of steepest descent to adjust the parameters, okay? Now, if you look at the features here, right, uh, you realize that th this program of approximation of a function is in fact very different from what is typically done when one uses classical uh, representation like Galerkin uh, projection, etc. Why? I mean, there's essentially three features that makes it different. The first one is that neural network approximation are nonlinear function representation in the sense that they depend nonlinearly in the parameters. This is very different than what you would do, for example, if you project on the first few mode of Fourier basis or in any other you know, first few mode in a Galerkin truncation, because they're typically the, the, the weights that you need, the, the functions that are fixed, and you just need to fix weights, which are interlinearly. Here, it's a nonlinear representation, which means that the approximation power of neural network is much more difficult, a priori, to quantify. So that's one question that we need to address. The second question is the one that is related to the fact that you don't know the risk exactly, but you need to use within an empirical risk. Uh, there is the question of, well, when you replace the population risk by the empirical risk, you're making this expectation over the data set. And typically the data comes in high dimension. That's why you need to use this expectation to begin with. And so, you know, there's a question as how good will the approximation that you learn of the function on this data set do outside of the data set? And that is what typically called the generalization error. And this is one of the big mystery of you know, why, why is there a good generalization, small generalization error in these, uh, in, in these parts? For example, if you, if you go back to the problem of Go, obviously you're gonna train the game on an infinitesimal subset of all potential games that could be played. And yet you will be able to deduce or to play new games. Okay, so that's a you know, small generalization error. And then finally, <clears throat> there's another problem, which is that when you try to optimize the parameters, and in particular, you do it by steepest descent, you are doing gradient descent on a non-convex uh, landscape, but simply because since the parameter enter the problem non-linearly, you cannot expect the landscape to be convex. And so as a result, you are dealing with a non-convex optimization problem, which is actually fairly complicated because local algorithm like gradient descent typically converge to the first nearest minima uh, on the landscape, you know, first closest to the initial point that you took for your parameters. So one needs to try to understand and quantify why is it that these local minima that are reached by the algorithm in practice are actually good minima, meaning that, you know, they, they, they achieve a good approximation and they achieve good generalization. So these are the three aspects that I'm going to be discussing. Okay. So let's first discuss a little bit the static picture and to try to understand, you know, how can we, uh, you know, understand the, 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 the function space in which one learn when we learn with a neural network. And, and in fact, this is, you know, this, this is in some sense an old story, which goes back to results from the 80s or even 70s and then in 90s by Barron, Sibben, Coed Park and many other. And, and, and these results have been revisited recently. They are very nice paper quoted here that give you, uh, would give you an overview of that. 
So the idea basically is to say this, that you can think about a neural network approximation as a discretization with n atoms of function that are given by an expectation. And so in order, in, instead of thinking about the neural network as a weighted sum uh, or, or with, of the units on the parameters, you can replace that by an expectation. And it's an expectation with respect to a radon measure, meaning it's a measure that doesn't necessarily need to be positive, nor normalized to one, but has a finite total variation. So this is the natural space in which one can define uh, learning for neural network, simply because this is the space that you would reach in particular if you let the number n, which is the, the, the width of the layer of the network, tend to infinity. And interestingly, uh, this, this, the, the function that you can represent in this way, define a Banach space, which is a metric space. And it's sometimes it's denoted as F1, in particular by Francis Back, but it's also called Baron space by Wen and Er. And so this is it's a bit of a tautology in a way. It's the space of function that can be represented in the way that I just defined. But the interesting fact is that this is a norm space. So you can introduce a norm in this space, which is simply you, the, the, you, so it's the gamma one of F that the norm of this function is the total variation of the measure. So it's the smallest total variation of the measure is the measure is the small, is the total variation of the radon measure that represent the function where you minimize over all possible radon function. Okay. And so now there is two results that you have uh, if you work in this space, which is the advantage of working in this space, which is first, and these are the old results, this space is dense in L2, meaning that it shows that in some sense, neural representation are in principle complete, meaning that you can use them to represent any function uh, in L2 approximate, you know, arbitrary close. And these are results that go back to Baron Sabaker at Park. Is they are referred to as universal approximation theorem. And second, it immediately gives you using this norm, immediately gives you an indication of what the generalization gap or generalization error will be because it's controlled by the norm. In particular, you know that if you take the empirical risk, the difference between the empirical risk and the population risk, and you look at the maximal discrepancy that you have here for all functions that are in a ball in that space, meaning that their norm is smaller than a certain uh, value delta, you can bound this discrepancy by something that involves a constant that could depend on the limit, the norm, the, the size of the ball square, and is divided by the square root of the number of units that you have, uh, the number of data points that you have. Okay, and again, this is not plagued by the curse of dimensionality because it's a square root of n. So the, 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 the number of data points that you have doesn't need to increase with the input dimension of the function. Okay, of course, like with the other result, the constant here could be very nasty. So you need to control that. And clearly, this is only telling you that you will only be able to learn a priori or generalize for functions uh, that they have a small variation norm. And, and you know these spaces that needs to we need to understand what that means. I'll go back to that uh, later in the talk. So there's another aspect that is very important uh, of the problem is that not only so you know we have a space in which we can learn, right? But in some sense, this is an abstract space because you don't have access or you cannot manipulate these measures, but you can realize them in a way by using Monte Carlo. And 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 what does that mean? Is that well, if I manage to find you know, a probability measure, which is such that is marginalization weighted by the weights, give you the right, a radon measure, right? And I can, any given radon measure, and I can draw parameters from this probability measure, the CIs and the ZIs, then I know that by the law of large number, if I make an empirical average over this sample of my units, it will converge towards the, um, the expectation that I'm looking for. So it will converge towards the, the function in F1 that is represented by this Radon measure. And similarly, the central limit theorem tells me that the error that I'm gonna do will be of order one over square root of M, meaning that if I look at the square loss, right, between the target 
and this representation by the neural network with m units it will scale like one over m that's the second statement from the central limit term with again you know a, a, a with a variance that you can control and in fact you can see that this variance it's a little calculation is again related to the norm gamma one that they've been you know the variation norm of the function so in other words it says that in this space you have a priori good generalization and good approximation as long as you try to learn functions that have small norm in, in the norm that they have just introduced. Okay. So this really, you know, is the basic ideas that 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 you know suggest that neural network can have very good approximation and generalization uh, power. But but what is important, and this was you know, this was the stage that it uh, you know the, the, the field in a way was in until a couple of years back. But it's important to realize that, that it's an insatisfactory picture at this point because it's a static picture, meaning we don't know what if I give you a target function f, you don't know a priori what gamma is, and so you don't know how to know mu, the probability measure that's mentioned on this slide, and so a priori you don't know to draw the parameters, and so there is something else that needs to be done, which is that we need to guarantee that there is a way to learn these parameters, and of course, how do we want to learn them? We want to learn them by gradient descent. So that means that we want to guarantee that if we draw these parameters in some sense from a distribution, which is not the right one, but then we update them to gradient descent, eventually they will give you a good approximation. Okay, so that's what I'm going to discuss next. So in order to do that, I mean, let's try to revisit what gradient descent is actually doing. And I think about it in the, in the following way. First of all, I can rewrite the loss function uh, I, I explicitly in terms of the parameters that it uh, contains. And so that's just expanding the square and doing a few expectations. And so you see that the loss is in fact some function that involve, uh, so it's, it's, it's a function of all the theta, which are all the parameters in all the layers of my network and it's given in the first line. And then when you do uh, training by gradient descent, right, it's easier conceptually to think about this as, as a dynamical system, which is continuous in time, in which case, what one would simply say is that you just solve the equation that I written, the second equation on the slides, which is that the, the time derivative of the parameters along the training is simply given by the minus the gradient of the loss. Okay. And so the, the gradient, you know, do steepest descent over this loss. Right. And, and so this is what we want to understand what is happening with this system uh, of equation. And this can be generalized. Here I'm considering the case of the population risk, but this, this can be generalized if we do what's called ERM, so empirical risk minimization, where we use the empirical risk. Okay, so if you look at this and, you know, you think about that as, as someone who does, you know, no statistical mechanics or statistical physics, it, it immediately tells you maybe what I, what I should do here is, in fact, look at these parameters as particles and think about this as a system of interacting particles. And that's, you know, the idea that Grant Rotskoff and myself introduced. And so once you understand that, well, you realize that, you know, as typical in statistical mechanics, you're not that much interested at what the parameters are doing individually, but you might be interested in what they are doing collectively. And in the context of neural network, it's clear why you need to do that. is because if you look at the function representation, actually, the one that is written by Fm equal, you know, one over m, the sum over i, one to m of the units, right? You realize that you don't, what you care about is not what theta, the thetas are doing, the parameters are doing during evolution, but you care about what f is doing during evolution, the function they represent, okay? And so one way to understand that or to formalize that is essentially you can think about the function as an expectation with respect to an empirical distribution. What is the empirical distribution? Well, is the empirical distribution of the particle. So the only thing that you are doing if you do, you go from particle to the empirical distribution, you're doing an operation that is well known in statistical mechanics, which is essentially you're saying, I only care whether there is a particle or a parameter at a given location. I don't care what's the label of this, right? You, you make them all indistinguishable. And this, of course, is legitimate in the current context because 
the parameters or particle in the network are interchangeable. They all play a role which is similar. In other words, uh, whether in the neural network, unit one is unit one and unit two is unit two is irrelevant. I could flip the, the index, it doesn't matter, okay? So why is it useful to look at the problem in this way? Well, it's useful because I can now write down an evolution equation for the empirical distribution of the particle. And I mean, that equation is very well known to any you know, physicist. It's in fact, the nonlinear Liouville or is a Vlasov equation. And, and this equation can really be derived uh, from, from the equation for the, the parameters themselves, essentially by using chain rule. Okay, and I have written it here, you know, in strong form, but you should really understand this equation is weak form by testing it against a test function, but that's not very important. Now, as soon as we have obtained this, right, we, we realize that we can use tools from statistical mechanics or probability theory to try to understand what happened when I take the width of the network to infinity. Uh, in the static context, this was the law of large number, but in, in the dynamical context, what law of large number is really mean field, is referred to as mean field or hydrodynamic limit, okay? And again, it says that if the number of particles or parameters in the network is large, right, collectively, they could do something which is much simpler to understand that if I want to track what they are doing individually, you know, what, what one is used to in statistical mechanics. So there's a little picture here. It's a movie that, you know, I want to show you. That, that illustrate what is the mean field or hydrodynamic limit in a, you know, visually for those of you who have not seen it. So what you should think about here is that every white dot is one unit in big network, okay? Of course, the problem is more inspired from statistical mechanics and interacting particles here so that I can make a movie. But the, you know, the, the mental picture you should have is that every dot that you have in this picture is a unit in, in a complex, you know, in a, in a large, uh, in this case, 10,000, units neural network. And so, and what they do, and that's the illustration that they do is that, as you could see here, there's two term, right? In, in the interaction, there's a one body term and a two body term. So the one body term is the one that, you know, what I've done here is simply, so the one body term is that every particle feels the potential that's under it individually. And then what they also do is that they interact and they repel, okay? And so the dynamics, which doesn't involve any noise, the only randomness is the way I've drawn the initial condition, is that this dynamics will be a steepest descent on the landscape, which is not the one that you see, but the one that you see plus the interaction between the particles. And as a result, you understand, you know, you can qualitatively understand or, or, or guess what's going to happen is that the particle want to lower their energy, but they want to fly far away from one another at the same time. And one way to do this is in fact for some of them to go into the other way. This is again just by steepest descent, right? They're just, they're, they're gonna occupy as much space they can in low energy, the one that you see here, while at the same time, right? Making their distance away, okay? And so here's what happened if you look at the movie. And I think uh, I, I don't need to explain why this main field is also called the dynamic limit anymore, is that as you can see, Collectively, these particles do something which is fairly simple, right? Even though if I were to redo the experiment again, drawing the, my initial condition, which is the initial parameter in the network, if you wish differently, I would have gotten something completely different, okay? And so what the hydrodynamic limit tells you is how the distribution of these particles evolve rather than the particles themselves. And so you can now take this, you know, uh, this, this, this limit, and, and what you obtain, you know, these are very, this is all reasons that go back to Mark Cass and Blasov, et cetera. It's called propagation of chaos by Mark Cass. You obtain an equation, in fact, it's the same as before, except that the initial condition is different now. The initial condition is the measure by which the distribution that you use to draw the parameters rather than their empirical distribution. And now there's a certain, this picture is actually quite interesting for the analysis because there's a few things that you can deduce. First of all, you can deduce that the dynamics that you have obtained here is also a gradient flow, simply because the parameters were satisfying a gradient flow, and so the empirical distribution satisfy a gradient flow, and so does the limit, the dynamic limit measure. Okay, and this gradient flow is simply a motion over an energy landscape, which is nothing but the loss expressed in terms of the measure. Is the E 
right? And then you take the gradient of E with respect to mu functional gradient, you get the V, which is, you know, the, the, the velocity, if you wish, this, the velocity over which the measure moves. Now, the only complexity is that this is not a standard gradient flow, it's a gradient flow in a Wasserstein metric, uh, which means that it has slightly different properties. And I'm going to elucidate that in a minute. And, you know, it can be understood as the, as the limit of uh, what's called a proximal scheme. Now, the important part here is that, uh, is to realize that once you have done that, right, the ruggedness of the landscape as that was viewed by the particles and the parameters are completely disappeared at the level of the distribution. Why? Because even though the loss was non-convex in the space of the parameters, it is no a convex, in fact, a quadratic function of mu, the distribution. So there is a unique minimizer. Sorry, there's a unique minimum, not the same minimizer, right? And so we well, simply no need to understand whether the dynamics reaches that. And, and the picture that they've you know, done here, this dynamic limit, is something that appeared in a series of papers simultaneously. They are listed at the bottom in, 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 in 2018, essentially, by Montanari and then by myself and, and Grant and, and by Sirigano and, and Spiliopoulos. Okay, and it leads the way to trying to analyze what's going on, there's a little bit of a difficulty that you need to, you know, go over is that the dynamics as is well known uh, of, of blast of equation like that, even though it's a gradient descent, may not reach the minimum. There's only one minimum, but it may, it may stop along the way. And that's simply because the mobility that you have in the equation is proportional to the measure itself. So if the measure becomes fast, it could stop. Okay, in technical terms, this is something which is called lack of geodesic convexity. And I'm not going to essentially go into the detail, but one can show that even though this is a problem in standard particle system, it's not a problem in this specific class of particle system that come from neural network. And that's essentially uh, because of the structure that you have and, and the, the presence of the, this inner layer of weight. And, and in fact, more technically, it's essentially uh, saying that the, the energy that you are evolving at the end of the day is not an energy for the measure itself, the priority measure, but rather for the radon measure that we have been discussing at the beginning of the talk. And as a result, we, we can show that spurious stationary points on the landscape are always avoided by good initial condition, the one that I use in practice. And so that says that if the measure converge in time, then it will necessarily be such that it represent, it converges to something that represents the target function. Okay, so you can summarize this part of the talk essentially by saying the following thing is, is the dynamical equivalent of the universal approximation theorem that says that if you train a network with finite width by gradient descent, then you can think about what happens. So you train, you know, you're working at the level of parameters, of course. In the mean field limit, meaning if the width of the layer becomes infinite, infinity, then what you will see can be captured by a mean field limit that has an evolution that guarantees that it will converge towards the target function that you're trying to approximate in this space F1. Okay. And, and this was, uh, you know, we gave qualitative argument to formal asymptotics about this statement in our paper with, with Grant. And then Lena Shiza and Francis back in a paper a little bit later actually gave a, a rigorous proof of this statement. And, and you know, these results also show that the limit commutes, so you can take T and M going to infinity in, in, in different ways. What's important here, if you want to think about this from the context of, you know, uh, on the one hand, statistics and on the other, scientific computing, is that the parameters themselves in the neural network may converge to very different values, right? So in, in statistical terms, that means that the model is not identifiable. This is simply meaning that the landscape remains rugged, the lost landscape remains rugged at the level of the parameters. And so they can reach many different local minima. What the, the theorem tells you is that all of these local minima at the end have the same quality in terms of the function representation that, that, that they induce. And, and, and it's good in the sense that it reaches the target, okay? If you think about this from a viewpoint of numerical analysis, it's also a very different way to think about the problem and training is, again, more akin to Monte Carlo method uh, 
rather than standard method of you know gabapentin truncation or, or finite element, right? But it you know it gives you an equivalent if you wish uh, of, of these Monte Carlo type ideas in the context of regression or function representation. Of course, what you have here is still not sufficient to understand good uh, approximation properties because in order to quantify approximation properties, you need to quantify what is the rate of conversions in M, right? Uh, if, 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 um, if we had, if the rate of conversion is dramatically bad in M, it would mean that, you know, to reach this infinite wide limit, which you, you would need to take too large a network to be practical. But of course, here we can you know, generalize the other component that comes into Monte Carlo, which namely the, the central limit term. We know that initially the central limit theorem meaning applies with the standard scaling, which is one over the square root of the width of the network, right? And so what we simply now need to quantify is whether the scaling is preserved in time. And here too, we can use known results from, you know, interacting particle systems that go back to Brown and App and then Alain Sol Sittman, that in fact tell you that you can write down a dynamical CLT which tells you all the fluctuation at CLT level are evolving in time, okay? And the only difficulty here is that since we are, we are talking about training a network, we need to actually show that not only these fluctuations are finite in the CLT scaling at finite time, but that they remain finite at infinite time. If you wish that the covariance doesn't explode, and that's a series of results that you know we have obtained recently with uh, Joan Bruna and and, and uh, Zheng Dao Chen, uh, where we actually show that indeed it remains controlled for infinite time. And in fact, there is something which is quite interesting that is happening, namely, so that's the statement of the term, right? And what it says is that you can actually bond the variance of the error you make at infinite time by the values that you would get from resampling. Okay, and so that's an interesting statement. Let me try to explain it in a different way. Imagine that I were to give you the, the radon measure that you need to have to represent the function. So thought experiment between general, you don't know it, but imagine that you could. Then one thing that you could do is just, you could say, well, let's just, you know, use the network where every parameter in the units is done simply by picking up randomly, so drawing the parameters from that measure. What the result here says is that rather than doing simply that, you should do that and then train the network, because if you train the network, you will um, lower the error, okay? In the experiment that I just described, it's quite obvious that that needs to be the case. What is more interesting is that it is the case, even if you don't start with this, you know, this measure, is that the future that you will get will always be on a lower scale than the one uh, that you would get by resampling at any stage of the, you know, of the optimization, okay? So putting together these two results essentially say that uh, we can indeed be the curse of dimensionality in, in neural network, uh, at least if we can control the norm. So if we look at functions that have small norms, this gamma one norm. OK, so since we need to control the norm, right, one thing that needs to be done, and I'll just go briefly over this, is that, well, I mean, it might be necessary, in general, it is necessary during the training to introduce rigorization term that will control the norm that controls the error, OK? And one way to do that is simply to add the rigorizing term in the equation, and then you need to redo the whole analysis if you have these regression terms that are added, and it is a little bit more complicated because no, you know, you this may impede conversions, and so what we have shown, and but I'm going to go quick on this slide because I don't, I'd like to go to the end of the talk or the topic is that we can show that there are ways to modify the dynamics in such a way that they guarantee conversions, and and again, the only thing that maybe the take home message here that is interesting is that if you look, you know, what I have done so far is I have shown how you can analyze the gradient descent dynamics at the level that is done on the network 
by looking at this, you know, how it induces evolution of measure, right? It's just an analysis tool. But in fact, you can go the other way around, which is that you can now modify the equation of the measure to accelerate conversion, to give it better property, and then ask yourself whether this is realizable at the level of the particles. And what we showed in the paper with John Bruna is that indeed this can be done because you can add term in the mean field equation that accelerate conversions. These are the term proportional to alpha in the equation of the middle of the slides. And then you can, you can think, well, actually I can realize that in the level of training in this specific instance, for example, it's, you know, in addition to the gradient descent dynamics, it just amounts to introducing a burst test dynamics of the neural, a neuronal burst test, which is that the units in your network are now equipped with a fitness and depending on whether they are fit or less fit, they can decide to duplicate or to terminate themselves, to, to disappear, right? And, and these are techniques that you can use to train the network faster, okay? If you wanna understand what is going on in the ERM setting, meaning if you do empirical risk minimization, well, it's essentially, you know, it is the same story. Essentially, it's just that at this level, it really becomes very important to do the regularization because the regularization is the one that will control this norm. Okay. And the two take home message here that are very important is that there is no over parameterization. You could think about the fact so, what you, you know, if you are in the ERM setting, and particular risk minimization is there something strange that is happening, which is that the number of data points that you are using is lower than the number of parameters that you need to train in the network. Okay. And so this, you know, there's, there's an alarm bell that should ring immediately here and say, oh, oh, I mean, is it possible that I will overfit? Right. And in fact, there is no overfitting in that regime. That's what is visible. So as long as you control the norm. So, and, and the reason is again explained by the existence of these limits. And so, you know, in a nutshell, that means that you shouldn't worry about the width of your network, even if it leads to over parameterization, but you should control the weights. If you do that, you'll be fine with these networks. Okay. So, you know, here are a few take home message for this point of the talk, and then I'll take a few minutes to discuss a few other topics, which is that what the picture that we have you know, uh, that has emerged the last few years uh, shows is that it suggests that if you train net the networks that I've been discussing here by gradient descent, then one can expect that they will be able to represent function in this F1 space, which is dense in L2, I remind you, using an error bound that contain several things. One would be a, a term that is proportional to one over M. So that's the error you make because your network is as only finite width. There's a term that be proportional to one over square root of N. That's the error that you make because there is only N data points. So that's if you wish the generalization error. And then there's a little price that you need to pay, which has to do with the, the fact that you need to rigorize the network to control the norms. Okay. And all of these constants are implicit, explicit. So that means that if you want to reach a level of accuracy, you know, you would have to adjust the C, the C prime and the lambda to go below that, that level of accuracy. Okay. Now, uh, we are not there quite yet because the current results that we have are mostly asymptotic in N, the width of the network, uh, in N, the, the number of data point in M, the width of the network. And so as a result, we can't really, we, we, you know, the, the, the formula they've written there is not proven yet. That's uh, one thing. And then there's another thing that is not known is that, so we, do, you know, we, we don't know the, the conversions in time. We know that the conversion time happens, you know, is, is tailored to the conversion time at mean field level. So it doesn't depend neither on the number of data points nor on the width to be the order, but still we don't know it depends on dimension. Okay, and so these are open with thing that is the, the, the paper that I'm quoting. There are a few papers that discuss this, but uh, you know, they, they are, they, you know, there they is still many open questions. And in addition, if I want to list a few more open questions, right? There is one thing that is clearly unsatisfactory here is that the way the generalization error is being calculated is is using a, a bound that is very crude, and so prob it's 
quite certain that we can do better than this, but we don't know how. Okay. The second question is that, as you can see here, everything is relying on the fact that we need to have that the function that we want to represent needs to have this small variation norm. But in order to understand that, we need to understand the properties of the, the you know the, sp the Banach space that I introduced, and in particular, its connection with the standard classical approximation space. You know, or does F one in Sobolev spaces, for example, compare, etc., and that's something which there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. But it's, you know, it, it, so this is less of open question. And then, and I'm going to discuss that very briefly. No, generalizing this idea to deep architecture is still open. Okay, but what is interesting, and before I, I go to the next slide, is that despite the fact that there are many open questions here, uh, you know, we, so. We, are, we know what the right questions are. It's always a good step to trying to find what the answers are. Okay. Very briefly, I just want to mention that is when I say that the visualization to deep architecture is mostly open, there are results in this area already. In particular, there's a nice paper by Jin Feng Lu and, and Lexing Ying and collaborators. Uh, there are certain type of deep network that can be analyzed in the same way. And these are essentially networks that have a compositional structure. Well, what you do is that you take a shallow network like the one I discussed, and then you pass it through another shallow network and again and again and again. So you introduce depth this way. If you do that, this is what this formula show, well, you can do a mean field limit on every layer. And so you back in business, but, but there are questions that arise about the convexity, you know, the conversion, et cetera. So, you know, but there is a route to maybe analyze um, deep neural network also via this, 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 this picture that they've explained in the first few slides. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. We started a little bit uh, late, so I'm not completely sure how much time do I have. Paolo, like, I mean, can you give, allow me another five minutes or, or I'm, I'm running out of time? Yes, I think so. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I would like so I would like to go back to end the talk just with a few remarks and, and, and go back to the you know the, the question that I asked at the beginning, which is like um, you know, to which extent certain problems from scientific computing that were deemed intractable uh, you know a, a decade ago could potentially be revisited by using tools from machine learning, okay? And, um, okay, so the one way one could think about this, I think I have a slide that's unfortunately missing, is that there is a way to solve problems from scientific computing using neural network, which are all to solve PDEs using uh, tool from neural network. And, and these are what? These are PDEs that come as uh, the minimization of some objective function. So, if, for example, if I look at Poisson equation, I can think about it, or, or Schrodinger equation, I want to look at the ground state, I can form that as a minimization. And so much in the same way as what we do, for example, with variation on Monte Carlo, I could put an ansatz, a parametric ansatz for the solution in this objective function, and, and then simply, you know, try to optimize the parameters. And so in particular, one could use as, as pyrogic ansatz for the solution, a neural network and optimize the parameters. So, you know, in the context of Poisson equation for something like this, it would just amount to doing something of this type. Okay, what I've written here. Now the problem, so, and, and of course, you know, there's empirical evidence that this strategy could work, right? And many people, I just quote a few are investigating this quite actively to actually solve PD in high dimension. But there is an interesting aspect here, which uh, you know needs to be remembered, is that in this problem, unlike standard problem of machine learning, the data is not given to you beforehand. It needs to be generated. It, I have no data set. It's, so it's different than you know uh, uh, supervised learning like in the game of Go or, or the one that is used in AlphaFold because there is no data. I just need to do it myself, okay? Or we need to do it ourselves. And that, you know, offers it's both a curse and a blessing. So why is it a curse? Well, let's first explain that is that, well, of course I cannot, again, I mean, the loss that I have here, I cannot in general do this integration over X, the data, 
explicitly. So I will need to do it empirically. But if I do it empirically, here I don't have like the data distribution given to me. So I need to cook up one. If I take the naive one for the problem that I was discussing on the previous slides, well, typically this is gonna be a very bad estimator of my loss. But if I have a very bad estimator of my loss, then I'm gonna have very bad generalization error. And so the question that immediately this class of problem leads to is how do we manage, you know, to estimate the loss, the empirical loss, right? To get a good approximation through the empirical loss of the population loss, okay? And that's, that's something that, you know, and I'm just gonna end with this, right? which is that this is also an area where, where tools and ideas from uh, social mechanics can help because they tell how to do important sampling. And so what this suggests here is that in order to generate the data, it should be done something which is called inline learning where you generate it on the fly and it should be combined with important sampling, which is that you tailor the generation data to the solution that you are trying to compute, which is called active learning. Okay, and, and I, I'm not going to describe this, but I'm just going to you know, give you the reference at the end of the talk. Uh, also with Grant, we have shown that that can actually be done. So we have solved a, a PDE in 144 dimension, which is a fairly high dimension of PDE, efficiently by using tools like that. And, and it's a situation in which you, if you were not to use important sampling, it would not work. So, you know, you need to have two things for success to, to guarantee success here. The, the neural network needs to have the right approximation power. That's the first time part of the talk. But second, I need to be able to generate the data so that I can take advantage or full advantage of this approximation power. And that's really what we looked at in this paper. And we showed that this actually can be done. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, let me just conclude with a few remarks. Uh, this continuous viewpoint on ML, I'm using the terminology that was introduced by Wayne and Er, which is simply taking this infinite width limit, right, in, in the context that I discussed, is certainly useful for analysis and it supports the empirical evidence that neural network can do much better than standard interpolation or classical interpolation method. And of course, you know, this offers uh, exciting possibilities in scientific computing right, which we can now revisit problems that we thought were intractable and try to do them using these tools. But what obviously, you know, these results also show is that it's not a free lunch because in order for these things to work, you need to pay attention to the data generation, you need to pay attention to the network architecture, et cetera, et cetera. And they need to be tailored to the task or the problem that you want to solve because otherwise they will not work. And, and you know, because the constant that in all the estimates they give you, will probably blow up.